Morning. So good to be with you here today on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. I thought about whether or not I would mention this, and and maybe I'm going to get myself in trouble, but I heard somebody tattled on me last week for going a little bit long in my sermon uh, at the local restaurant. So I love you anyway. (laughs) No, I'm so glad that we're together, and hopefully I'll preach in a way that honors God and doesn't mess up your lunch plans. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Uh, we're going to quote our theme verse for the year as we begin from Psalm seventy-seven, eleven. It says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. We've been remembering this year. We have remembered forgotten people in Scripture. We've looked at some mighty acts and memorials of those acts by God in Scripture. We've talked about some forgotten doctrines. And today we're talking about what I've called a forgotten book. When you hear about, or you hear the words, Old Testament prophet, what name comes to mind? Perhaps Elijah, or Moses, or Isaiah, or Jeremiah. But if you're like me, Ezekiel is probably not the first name that comes to your mind. He is considered one of the major prophets, and the designation of major versus minor prophet simply refers to the length of the book that bears his name. The book of Ezekiel is the third longest prophetic book in the Old Testament after Isaiah and Jeremiah. Now, I find myself struggling from time to time with the Old Testament. I find it far more difficult to get my bearings and to understand passages of Scripture in the Old Testament when compared with looking at the New Testament. And I think there are several reasons for this, and I'm talking about me, uh, but maybe you identify with this as well. One reason is I'm not as familiar with the flow of history in the Old Testament and the way that the books of the Old Testament fit within that flow, as I would like to be. Another reason that I find it a little bit difficult to follow and understand the Old Testament is the people of the Old Testament do not think or write the way that we think and write. And so when we open an Old Testament book and we read a passage, whether it's from the poetic books or it's from the books of history or it's from the prophetic books, The style of writing is different than what we see in our newspaper and our novels and even in our nonfiction books today. But we want to believe that we can just open the Bible and understand it without doing any background work and looking at those kinds of things. And then there's one more reason, especially, that I find the Old Testament difficult, and it's the prevalence of prophetic literature. The prophetic books are perhaps the most difficult books in all of the Bible, whether we're talking Old or New Testament, to understand. And it helps us if we have a little bit of an understanding of what purpose prophecy serves. And there are more than just these three, but I want to notice three purposes that prophecy serves, and this is going to help us, I think, as we look in particular at the book of Ezekiel. Prophecy serves the purpose of proving God's role in history. When God says something will happen, he's showing us that he has a hand in the events of the world. And so prophetic uh, future prophecy shows us God's role in the actions and events of the world. Second of all, it shows us God's punishment for evil. One of the primary purposes that God tells things beforehand is to show that he is in fact punishing the wickedness of humankind in specific situations. And then third and finally, prophetic uh, literature helps us see the hope that God offers for those who will trust in him. And if we keep that perspective and that understanding of the purpose of prophecy, I think it helps us better understand the prophetic literature. And so this morning, as we look at the book of Ezekiel, what we're going to do is we're going to try to get a broad picture. Because I I consider for myself, and perhaps for you as well, this is not a book that we know very well. And so we're not going to dig into one single passage, but we're going to get a broad overview of the book. And so I'm I'm going to throw something up on the screen for you. And I've adapted it from the Bible Project. It's an outline of the book. I'm not going to go through all of that. But 
This outline looks at three major divisions in the book. The first 11 chapters talk about the tragedy of sin. Then the middle section of the book talks about God's judgment on the world, on His people, and specifically on the city of Jerusalem because of sin. And then the final section, verses 34 through 48, offers hope to the various groups previously mentioned. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take that division and we're going to take a sampling from each one of these sections and look first of all at the tragedy of human sin. Ezekiel, as a prophet of God, announces the tragedy of human sin. Now if we open up to the very first chapter, we're going to find Ezekiel's commission. He's going to have this vision of this strange chariot-like thing and or sitting on top of this chariot-like thing is the glory of God. And the glory of God is going to be a key theme throughout the book, and we'll refer to that more as we move through the lesson. But in these first 11 chapters, the glory of God is there to help us see the tragedy of sin. Not just the glory of God, but where God's glory resides and where it goes helps us understand the tragedy of sin. And so when we get to chapter 10 and we read verses 18 and 19, what we find is that the glory of God forsakes the temple. Now before we read these verses, I want to give you very quickly, I mentioned earlier, history. A little bit of context in the life of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was taken away in either the first or the second attack on Jerusalem. The scholars disagree about the exact timing. uh, By Babylon. You remember that Assyria attacked Israel and the northern kingdom was wiped out. And about a generation later, Babylon began to attack the southern kingdom of Judah. And some three or four times Babylon attacks uh, Judah and Jerusalem before they are too completely wiped out. Ezekiel is one of the first who is carried away from Jerusalem. He is of the priestly tribe. But he does not have an opportunity to serve in that capacity because he's taken away before he reaches the age when priests typically entered their service. And so he is given a prophetic commission, but he is in Babylon, and yet many of the visions that he receives from God actually pertain to the events in the southern kingdom. Now that can be a little bit confusing. But he's in Babylon seeing things that take place in Judah and then reporting those things to the people who are in Babylon in captivity. And in verses in chapters 8 through 11, he has an extended vision of events taking place in Judah, in particular in Jerusalem. He sees those who are remaining within the city doing very wicked, idolatrous things. He sees a vision of 25 men in the temple court turning their backs to God and facing and worshiping the sun. And that number 25 is representative because typically there were 24 priests and one high priest. And so all the entire priesthood is what the vision is saying, has turned its back on God and is worshiping false gods. And he continues to see these visions. And so when we get to chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, it's because of all of this wickedness, this rampant idolatry in God's kingdom, people that God spared and did not allow to be carried into captivity who have turned their backs on him, that we read these things. Then the glory of the Lord, this is Ezekiel's vision, the glory of the Lord went out from the threshold of the house, that is the temple, and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth before my eyes as they went out with the wheels beside them. And they stood at the entrance of the east gate of the house of the Lord and the glory of Israel was over them. If we come on over into chapter 11, we're not going to read the passage, but we'll find out that eventually this representation of God's presence, His glory, not only stands on the outskirts of the temple, but actually leaves the city and goes to a mountain. And so... That is representative of God forsaking His people. You remember the significance of God being with the children of Israel and the struggle that took place. Moses talking to God because the people had worshipped the golden calf and, and God saying, I can't dwell among these people anymore because of the things that they have done. And Moses says, if you, if you won't go with us, we can't go anywhere. And so God assents, consents, to, in a, in a specific fashion, continue to be with his people. But over the centuries now, since Moses, 
The people continue to turn their back on God and to turn towards idols. And so finally God says, that's it. I'm forsaking you. I'm no longer dwelling among you. And this is the tragedy of human sin. Because sin always, always, always destroys relationships and health. It destroys relationship with God. It destroys our relationship with other people. And we're going to talk about that more in just a moment. It also destroys our own well-being, spiritually, emotionally, even physically. And there's a, a story that's told by a man by the name of Gary Richmond. He was a zookeeper at one time, and he wrote a book called A View from the Zoo. And Mr. Richmond had a neighbor named Julie who had adopted a raccoon as a pet when it was very young. And she carried that raccoon on her shoulder everywhere she went. And, and people would laugh and enjoy seeing the interactions between Julie and her raccoon bandit. But when he was getting close to about two years old, Mr. Richmond was speaking to the veterinarian of the zoo about, he says, you know, it's so fascinating to see Julie and her raccoon and, and the unique relationship that they have. I've never seen a person with a pet quite like this. And he says, why don't more people have raccoons as pets? And the veterinarian said that when raccoons reach a certain age, maturity, their temperament changes. They become more independent and more volatile and more likely to attack human beings. And Mr. Richmond asked the veterinarian, well, do you think that there are any exceptions? And he said, not that I know of. And so he says, well, do you think that Bandit will attack Julie. And he says, it's very likely. And so Mr. Richmond went to his neighbor and he said, look, I'm telling you something that an eminent scholar, a, a renowned veterinarian of the world has told me. And Julie says, you know, I just, it just won't happen to me. Bandit's different. He would never attack me. About three months later, Julie underwent plastic surgery for lacerations to her face from her pet, Bandit, who had to be released into the wild. You know, that, that, that's the way sin is. Sin often looks attractive on the outside. But in the end, it is always destructive. James says in James chapter 1, beginning at verse 13, this about the process of sin in our lives. He says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Sin is always destructive. Sin destroys relationships. It separates us from God. It creates a barrier between us and God. Sin destroys marriages. It destroys families. It destroys friendships. It leads to fights and grudges and disagreements between family members and neighbors. Sin is always destructive of relationships. It looks fun and enticing in many cases at first. But just like the children of Israel who went after the idols because they thought that those idols could provide for them certain things and they said, God has already forsaken us. When all the time He was there and they sought after those things and it destroyed the connection that they had with God. Sin always destroys relationships. It always destroys health. There are many sinful practices that will lead to all kinds of disease. Whether it's cancer or it's transmissible diseases or whatever it may be. And sin also destroys our emotional health. Sin will make us feel this big. Will cause us to be proud. Will cause us to have angry outbursts. Sin is always destructive. And in the first 11 chapters of Ezekiel, if we take away nothing else, we take away the understanding that sin is, tra excuse me, tragic. Sin is tragic. 
As we move into the middle section of the book, we not only see Ezekiel announces the tragedy of human sin, but he also announces the righteousness of divine judgment. There are several sections of judgment upon various groups of people in the middle sections of the book. But I want to focus in on chapter 33 and God's judgment of the city of Jerusalem where the, where the book actually reaches its lowest point. Ezekiel chapter 33 beginning at verse 17 says this. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just when it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by this. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to his ways. In the twentieth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, a fugitive from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has been struck down. God judged His people. He punished them because of their wickedness. And ultimately, Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. And it's because of the wickedness of the people of God. Now, as we already mentioned, the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem several times. But this final time, they destroy the king's house, they destroy the temple, they destroy the walls of the city, they lay it all to waste. But all of this is not a result of the power of Babylon. It is a result of God's judgment on His people who would not be faithful to Him. We can see in the verses that we just read, God put a choice before His people. They could choose to do what was right and just and God would have allowed them to continue and live. But he says, if the wicked person persists in his wickedness or the righteous person turns to wickedness, then I will judge. I will punish. And they were saying, God is not just. Look at what's happened to us already. Look at all that has already happened to the southern kingdom. And God says, no. You brought this upon yourself. You cannot say that I have been unfair to you. I have been exactly the definition of righteous to you and will continue to be righteous. But because the people persisted in their wickedness, God judged them and punished them through the instrument, the tool of Babylon and destroyed the city and the king's house and the temple. We can't look at this and say God was unfair. A mercy by its very nature is something that is not deserved. It is not fair. And if all of us receive what we deserve, then we would be in the same position of the people who were in the southern kingdom of Judah. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 3. I know that this is probably a familiar passage for many of us. But it is so rich that I couldn't help but use it today in this lesson. He says, Now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 23 is the low point for all of us. Because there's not one of us who can say that we have lived a perfectly righteous life. There's not one of us who can say that we have obeyed God's law perfectly at any point in our lives. And so Paul says we've all sinned. He's quoting from the Psalms. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not one of us is on an equal plane with God. Not one of us deserves by what we have done to be in God's presence. But verse 24 is our hope and our glory because he says all have sinned but now are justified, verse 24, by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. That God was fair. How was He fair? In granting us mercy? No, that wasn't the righteousness. The righteousness was He allowed Jesus to take what we deserved. 
so that he could grant us this precious gift. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. But now in Jesus, he pays the price for all sin. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The center piece of the book of Ezekiel is God's judgment on sin. And there was not one person living in Ezekiel's day who could say that what God did in judging the city of Jerusalem, the kingdom of Judah, was unjust. And there's not one of us who could say that if God were to judge us on our own merits, that He would be unjust to punish us just as He punished them. But that's not what He has chosen to do. He laid the judgment that we deserved on Christ's shoulders on the cross so that you and I could have the gift of life and not know that judgment, but instead be made righteous by Jesus' blood. If we believe that Jesus is the Christ and we turn away from sin and we confess the name of Christ and we're baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, we're made new by God, 2 Corinthians 5, and we're justified. We're made righteous, not because of the things we have done, but because of what God in Christ has done for us. And so while Ezekiel announces God's judgment, that's not where the story ends. For us. Finally, as we look at the conclusion of the book of Ezekiel, we see the hope of God's renewal that is offered through the prophet. It is offered not only to the children of Israel, but to the nations, and specifically in a, a second vision of a new temple and a new city that Ezekiel has in the final chapters of the book. And you'll notice that I listed two different references there. I want to look first at chapter 43, verses 5 through 7. Ezekiel says, The Spirit lifted me up. He's having another vision now of a new city and a new temple. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Now remember what happened in the beginning of the book. God's glory forsook the temple. Now Ezekiel is having this vision, and it's a very extended description, there's no way we could read all of it, of a new temple. And this new temple is gigantic. It is humongous. If you look at the proportions that are described in the vision. And so now we see the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled this new temple. While the man was standing beside me, this is a messenger that has come to him in the vision, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple, and he said to me, Son of man, This is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. And the house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings, by their whoring and by the dead bodies of their kings at their high places. And it goes on and on talking about this renewal, this hope that God's people have because God is going to give them something new. And it's going to be greater and better than what was experienced before. Now, there's all kinds of discussion about the way that we ought to interpret these final chapters of Ezekiel. There are those who believe that this is a vision of a future reality, of a future dwelling in Jerusalem, in which God is going to send Christ to reign on earth in this new place for a thousand years. But there are a lot of reasons not to take that understanding when we look at these chapters. Among them is the scope of the description. That it is so enormous. And and then another reason that we would not take it that way is a number of the features of the temple that are described are dramatically different from any of the temples that were ever physically built in the land of promise. There is no... Gentile court, there is no court of women, there is no veil that separates the most holy place from the rest of the temple. There are difference after difference after difference. I don't want to go into all of that. But there's also something there for us to understand. That this new temple is greater and better and encompasses far more than the old one ever could. Now, Alan read for us from Galatians chapter 3 in which Paul says, those old barriers have been taken down in Christ Jesus. 
Now the way that we are a part of God's chosen people is not because we are born as a descendant of Abraham, but if we're born again in Jesus Christ, if we're baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, we're made a descendant of Abraham by God. And so this new temple encompasses more than just ethnic Jews. And it removes those former barriers that the law had in place. And so when we get to chapter 48, the very last verse of the book of Ezekiel. By the way, in this new vision, in the last portion of the book, the city is never, ever called Jerusalem. And in chapter 48, the very last verse It says, the circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits. My best understanding, I'm not a mathematician, is that's a circumference of six miles. And the name of the city from that time on shall be, the Lord is there. Remember, God's glory is one of the key themes of the book of Ezekiel. And what happens in the first section of the book? Because of the sins of His people, God's glory, His presence, forsakes them. And in this grand vision at the end of the book of God's renewal and the renewal of His people, the height of all of that is this. God dwells among them. He dwells with them. He dwells within them. Imagine if a time traveler came to the present day from the dark ages and witnessed all of the modern marvels of technology. Can you imagine coming from the setting of the dark ages to see a building like this one? Electric lights, indoor plumbing, air conditioning. I'm especially thankful for that, having lived all of my life in the southern part of the United States of America. How overwhelming that might be. And then imagine if that person had to return to the Dark Ages. How would they describe the things that they witnessed? Not the way that you and I describe our modern technology. They would have to describe the things that they saw in a way that was appropriate for their setting. But also imagine how exciting it would be for that person living in one of the worst periods of human history to witness the things that you and I take for granted. Now that is an imperfect comparison for what Ezekiel saw when he saw this in this vision of a renewed city and a renewed temple. But my point for us is we need to be very careful that we do not take for granted not these physical things, not the air conditioning or the electric lights or the indoor plumbing, but the blessings that we have through what Jesus Christ accomplished in His life, death, and resurrection. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, beginning at verse 10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them, that is, the prophets of old, that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news, the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Do you know that the present blessings that you and I experience in Jesus Christ, the glory of God within us, The blessing of salvation, of being made righteous in God's sight in spite of our imperfections, and the hope of perfect holiness one day in the presence of God, these are things that the prophets wanted to know about, but it wasn't revealed to them. These are things that the angels wanted to look into, but they could not see, and yet you and I have them today. Ezekiel had this grand vision in terms that he could understand, 
But it's what you and I are experiencing now in the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. Is that not amazing? Okay, where's the amen? Amen, Walls. Brother Bill Davis was. Is that not glorious? Is it not glorious what we have experienced in Jesus Christ? Is the church not a wonderful thing that God has given to us, a people whom God has chosen, not because of who our grandfather was, not because we are Jew or Greek, male or female, bond or free, but because of what God has done in Jesus Christ? We have salvation. We have the hope of eternal life. Is that not glorious? Amen. That's why we're here today. When we look at the book of Ezekiel, uh, it's, it's an imperfect outline. But we see the tragedy of human sin. And we need to be reminded of that in our own lives. Because sin will deceive us. It will pull us in and entice us. But the end of it is death. We see God's judgment. He is a righteous God. He will do what is just and right. And without the grace that He has provided in Jesus Christ, the only just and right thing, the only just and right outcome of our lives would be punishment. But we also see a great hope. Something that even Ezekiel did not fully understand, but that has been now realized in Jesus Christ and which you and I can enjoy in the present and in eternity in the presence of God. Maybe you need to take hold of that hope this morning. God is inviting you through His Gospel, through what He has done in Jesus Christ, to take hold of that hope and of life in the present and in eternity. If you're not yet a Christian, we invite you to come. If you are a Christian and you need to return to God, or if you simply need prayers and encouragement from those who are gathered here today, God's invitation is open to you as we stand and sing together.